Hey YouTubers, it's me, Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. Uh, I'm going to continue reading this from Dr. Don, John W. Goffman, Oral History Conducted by the Department of Energy. Uh, we still have quite a ways to go, and I really can't read this more than 10 or 15 minutes a night. I just did like a 40 minute long uh, video about uh, Trumpy's, um, I guess I should call him President Pussy Grabber, shouldn't I? Uh, or President Predator, as my daughter asked me not to call him. She, she said that that is triggering for her for me to call him that. So I refrain from that. That is what I would call him, though, actually. Because that's he's an admitted he's an admitted sexual assaulter uh, about their picks and it's actually way worse than I thought on election day I would have thought that Trump would have picked somebody that any of these people he's doing nothing but picking billionaires and people who are in the neoliberals who want to really roll in if any of you have not learned about Latin American politics you need to learn and see what we did to South America and why it's such a fucking mess because of neoliberal ideas imposed upon them and they are about to do it to our country what they did to them you think that we have all these undocumented people here for a reason they're here on purpose because it's the push pull and you know what we don't have anywhere to go so we're going to see starving children and starving old people in our street just this week already they've cut off the medicare aid for the old people and for the disabled they're going after us folks but i you know i did a 40 minute video i wanted you to meet all of his picks and i think congress is just going to lay down and give him everything he wants none of they're all going to be appointed and uh the world is not going to look like a happy place this time next year which is why i'm reading this story so that we can understand how it all got started the mindset of the people who chose to start killing us all in the 50s they turned the weapons that they said they wanted to use on our quote enemies and they're using them on us so we left off here and i'm going to continue reading goffman says <clears throat> oh hefner asked him this question he even signed an agreement that no patients would be seen over at ucb Yet they were, Goffman. Oh, I didn't know that John had signed that agreement. The hell was violated out of that agreement, I could tell you. I got there in 1947. Hardin Jones and I met the summer before, during the year of my internship. He was enthusiastic to get me to come over there. I think I got the appointment because of Hardin Jones. I just arrived at Berkeley in 1947. I talked to John, who said, if you want to work in the clinic, we'd love to have you. So I did. I started out working every Friday, taking care of those patients. I never heard anything about a conflict at all, but we, assure, we sure as hell were treating patients. Hefner. What do you think of Professor Jones? Goffman. I thought very highly of Hardin Jones. He was a great facilitator of work. He's very bright in the first place. Hardin's a guy who had golden hands in the laboratory. A superb investigator, but Hardin just seemed to enjoy meddling around other people's work rather than enjoying him, rather than working himself. I got him interested in the lipoprotein work we were doing. He did help some, but mostly he just wanted to facilitate things. We wrote some papers together. He's a damn smart guy. Totally up and up guy. You could trust him with everything. We did a lot of work together, and I would say that for me, Hardin Jones facilitated a lot of things, a lot of the things that I got done in every way, running interference in the university. If I had to run interference for John in the university too. Oh, and I had to run interference for John too. That happened because I had some influence in the university in a peculiar way that had to do with Ernest Lawrence getting very excited about our heart disease work. He'd bring regents around so the chairman of the board of regents thought I was the best thing since sliced bread and things like that. Well, that's my hair is all messed up. That group in San Francisco really wanted to kill the Berkeley operation in John Lawrence's hands. It was an ongoing thing. I remember working with Mrs. Hurst, who was a regent, to try to offset some of these things. 
I met her through uh, Ernst and John. We cooked up this thing to have a big celebration for the 20th anniversary of John's coming to the campus with a lot of fanfare, mostly to offset this thing from San Francisco. <coughs> I was bipartisan to the Berkeley operation then, although I didn't know any of the background of why they were jealous, except they were. A lot of crazy things there. I was awarded the golden-headed cane, which was given to the senior medical student with the best promise of being a true physician. We get a cane with a gold head on it. Professor Kerr was one of the, was the one who instituted this thing at UCSF. And I was a lecturer in the medical department. But talk about jealousy. By 1952 or so, we'd gotten an awful lot of publicity nationally and internationally in connection with the heart disease work. Professor Kerr called me up and he wanted to see me. He came over to Berkeley and said, I didn't know what he wanted. He said, I had to talk to you about your work on the heart disease. You know, I'm a professor of medicine at the medical school and you're in my department. I said, yes, I know. I'm a lecturer in the medical department. My assistant professorship is here at Berkeley. He said, you never checked with me about publishing your papers. I said, of course not, Professor Kerr. We don't do that here. I don't check with John Lawrence either when I publish a paper, and it never occurred to any of us to check with anybody. Well, he said, that's not how we do things. I said, well, what do you want me to do? There's an easy solution, Professor. Just remove my name from the medical school department affiliation because I'm not going to check my work with anybody. He said, well, we don't have to be that drastic about it. You know, that's crazy. Absolutely crazy. He should have been very happy we were doing the work. We got a lot of recognition for the University of California. Here he was. This was a totally separate battle from John Lawrence's battle. But he left and never checked any papers. And we never checked any papers with Professor Kerr. I did a number of collaborative studies with other people in the Department of Medicine and published them, Felix Cobb and Alex Simon in Psychiatry. So there were these antagonisms, and you know, there was an antagonism that was bred out of this thing. The first year curriculum of the medical school was in Berkeley. The second, third, and fourth year were in San Francisco. Anatomy, physiology, biochemistry were all in Berkeley. In the 1950s, there was a debate about whether the whole medical school should have to go to Berkeley or should the first year or should the first year move to San Francisco. The San Francisco people, I think largely the entrenched doctors in San Francisco, won. The first year moved to San Francisco. I still think they thought that anything that had to do with humans belonged to them. They were jealous of our work and jealous of John's work separately. Hefner, you also worked for Cornelius Tobias, who was in that department. Ha Goffman, he was, and I didn't work with him at all. Hefner, okay. Goffman, Tobias and I were always friendly, but he was working in the radiologic. He was working on the radiobiological effect. I knew him, but we weren't close. I did a lot of work with Hardin Jones, but practically nothing with Tobias Hefner. Okay, so is there anything else about that group worked? How, about how that group worked? How were you a part of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, Goffman? When I came there in 1947, I had an assistant professorship in what was called the Division of Medical Physics a branch of the physics department under Professor Raymond Burge, B-I-R-G-E. Our appointments were 50% of our salary came from the Rad Lab AEC funds and 50% was from the university. But it was understood that if anything were to ever happen to the Rad Lab funds, the university would pick it up. I was in the Rad Lab. New subtitle, Reflections on Ernest Lawrence Hefner. How were you treated by all the physicists? Were you a welcomed group? Goffman. 
Yes, I think we were a very welcomed group. When I did the work on heart disease, I needed a lot of subjects to get blood, to do studies. Not with radioactivity, but with vitamins, things like that. We were trying to influence by, we were trying to influence by blood lipopre, I don't understand that sentence, so I'm going to read it again. We were trying to influence by blood lipoproteins. There were all kinds of people in the RAD lab who volunteered to be subjects in our work. We were very enthusiastic. We received in the early years, like 1950, one or two invitations. I was invited up, to, up the hill to talk at the Physics Colloquium. There were about 250 people. There I had to talk on the lipoproteins and heart. You get the idea on what the quality of the leadership of that lab was with Lawrence, Ernest Lawrence there. I figured that physicists would know about the optical system of the ultra centrifuge, and I wasn't about to try to explain it. So I went over that so I went over that very lightly. At the end of my lecture, a voice from the back of the room said, John, I don't understand the optical system. It was Ernest Lawrence. There were 200 scientists there in Ernest Lawrence. He was such an unassuming guy. So I went over it a little bit, the equations, and he said, John, I still don't understand, but I'll come down and see you about it. And I thought, he's never going to come down and see me about this thing. About two weeks later, I was sitting in my office about 5.30 in the afternoon doing some work. Ernest Lawrence sticks his head in the door and said, I'd like to see that optical system in the ultra centrifuge. We went back, took off the cover, took off all the housing, and went through it from the beginning to the end. He said, oh, of course, how's the work going? I said, well, it's going well, but we sure could use another ultra centrifuge. They then cost about $16,000. He said, come up to my office next week. I did go up, called his secretary for an appointment, and I got there and went in to see Wally Reynolds, who was the business manager in the RAD lab. Ernest said, Wally, John needs another ultra centrifuge. Wally said, it's not in the budget. You don't have the funds for it. Ernest said again, John needs another ultra centrifuge. Wally, get it. And I got it. Ernest Lawrence, if he thought you were sincere and were doing worthwhile work, it didn't matter whether it was high energy physics, low energy physics, or medicine. If you were working in his lab and he thought you were doing something useful, there was nothing too good for you in the way of facilitation of your work. Anything I didn't accomplish on my work was nobody's fault at Rad Lab but myself. Because I just have to say that with Ernest Lawrence's backing, I just had the royal carpet laid out for me to do the work. John Francis Nalen was the chairman of the Board of Regents, and Ernest brought him down. Ernest loved to tell the story about the heart disease and exactly what everything meant. He'd give a better lecture on it than I could. I studied John Francis Nyland's blood, and Nylon would bring in other visitors down to come and see. Berkeley Rad Lab in those days, being a part of it, especially with Ernest, was fantastic. I think I'll end here. Uh, the next uh, subtitle is called Heart Disease Studies. So we've already had 15 minutes of reading. So put your courage feet on, you guys. I'll end here. We're going to have to really build our character. These are character building days. That's what I call them. <laughs> Ciao.